second word here is peak oil. And this was uh, sort of advanced in 1956 by M. King Hubbard. Everybody familiar with M. King Hubbard? Shell oil, kind of visionary guy. And he said, you know, the way oil fields work is the production ramps up, it stays level for a while, and then it ramps down. And this is like about a 40-year interval. And as even as early as 1956, he saw how the U.S. and the world's inner supply were in the early days dominated by a single large find, and then later on dominated by several large finds, and then towards the end dominated by increasingly smaller finds. So when you add them all up, you get this smooth bell curve, and at some point you'll have peak oil, and then after that you have less oil. This part of the curve is a buyer's market. That is, if somebody tries to jack the price of oil up, you just go somewhere else and buy it. It's a buyer's market. But over here, it's a seller's market. That means that everybody gets to jack the price up. Has anybody noticed the price of gasoline, or this am I the only one? <laughs> so we're kind of like, uh, at this point, in peak oil globally, and uh, the uh, U.S. peaked out in the 70s or so. This is kind of an overview of the United States uh, economy, and uh, what we're going to be measuring uh, energy in, in is quads. One quad is 10 to the 15th BTUs. And uh, America uses about 100 of these. So uh, there's about 100 quads here. We get about uh, 22 of those quads from coal, another 19 from natural gas. And then we pump about 11 quads of crude oil, and we buy about 30 quads of crude oil. So <clears throat> one uh, way to sort of see how Washington works are the CAFE standards. This is the uh, mandate for mileage standards that uh, occur in the late 70s, during the, the oil embargo. So here comes the oil embargo. We're running out of gas, and Washington goes, OK, Detroit, you're going to have to increase the mileage of your fleet. You're going to have to bump it up to 27 miles per gallon. They kind of change this incrementally. Mm -hmm. So you can see the behavior of the industry. They started out selling cars that were like 125 horsepower. And the first thing they did was they started dropping the horsepower of the cars in order to meet the efficiency standard. And that went until they started beating the standard up here. And then what happened to the horsepower of the car? It went up. If this had kept going up, in other words, if the CAFE standard would say, well, now you're going to have to make 32, 35, 40 miles per gallon cars, then this horsepower would have stayed level or gone up at a less aggressive rate. All of the engineering that's been going into making cars more efficient has been going into making them more powerful, more sex appeal. You know, that's the marketing department that's controlling the action here. So here is an example of how someone might change their behavior. Here we have uh, Bill Gates in his, uh, no, no, we have Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> in his commuting in his Humvee. Three of them. Three. Oh, he's, oh so he's, he's, he's not in his Humvee, but he's towing two others. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so instead of getting a robust 11 miles per gallon, he's down to like three. So he has seven, he has a soul. Contrasted with uh, a thrifty commuter from this very room, commuting to work in a 50 mile per gallon at Prius with uh, four people. They all, you know, park with me. So the elasticity of demand in this case is 18. That is to say, this is delivering 11 miles per passenger gallon, <coughs> and this is delivering 200 passenger miles per gallon. A difference of 18. So, if we had a difference of 18 in our consumption of petroleum, <clears throat> our petroleum demand would go from, uh, what's this like, 40 something, down to 3. So suddenly, our domestic supply of crude would be more than enough to run all the prices. If I uh, put solar conversion on a house, the electric power is so expensive that it's worth it to replace <coughs> all the incandescent bulbs with uh, fluorescent bulbs, or, 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 or LEDs, which are yeah. even more efficient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's worth it to buy the $3,000 refrigerator because mm -hmm. I put in solar power, which costs a fortune. Typically, you're looking at, a, at an elasticity of about 2.3, and there's no difference in the quality of life in that house. So it's pretty easy for somebody in a residential house to lower their uh, power consumption Right now, available biomass in the country, 2.9 quads of energy. We're looking at a huge pile.
pile of ethanol. And let's suppose we started looking around for other sources of, uh, of uh, cellulose. There's about 21 quads of available cellulose. Does that make a dent in the oil? That's like what we import for uh, oil now. Okay, so now we've covered what's obviously going to be happening. Either through uh, public policy, which it would happen quickly, or through entrepreneurs, which it will happen slower. Which is, we'll see efficiency improvements in all of the areas that are radically affected by uh, peak oil. That is, as the oil price goes up, you'll see you know, people coming out of the woodwork, like me, to save 0.2 quads of energy to an obscure group of people, those who make paper. They have my deepest sympathies. Making paper is a great way to go broke. <laughs> Unless it's currency. <laughs> what are new ways to make power, new ways to make energy? Well, let's, let's start off with, who knows what a clack rate is? Well, Paul, uh, uh, Paul Steve. Steve knows what a clack rate is. And no one knows. Well, what about person knows about So let's suppose you are uh, algae in the ocean, and uh, some toxic thing comes by, and you know, toxic and you die. But if you go deep enough in the water, when the methane molecule gets released typically by a bacteria, instead of forming a gas that floats up as a bubble, it forms ice. And it's a real screwy molecule. It's like 11 methanes in, in 14 waters, some screwy thing. But this has been going on for a long time. And we now have about I, various estimates, 200 trillion cubic feet of a methane trapped as class rates around the planet. 182,000 quads. That's enough to run our country for 200 years. Have I got your attention? <laughs> Looking good. Are we mining these? Hell no. <laughs> so let's go to another technology that is being underinvested by our uh, Department of Energy. The Tesla Tower. So the whole Earth is oscillating at 8 hertz, and it's a, it's a tuned cavity. It's the Earth, ground plane, and the atmosphere. Okay? But it's got the atmosphere in between that's an insulator, and so it just sits there and oscillates. So what did uh, Nikola Tesla do, the sharp cookie that he was? He stuck a tower down there, and on this scale you can't even see that it's not even as big as that line. It's just a key, it's a spot down there. But he pumps it at the Schumann frequency at about a million volts. What does the atmosphere do? It starts doing this. Hours and hours and hours and hours goes this. Keeps coming lower. And at some point, there's a conduction path from the ground up high enough that you jump a local patch of the ionosphere and you get a lightning bolt up your life. A huge surge of current. Where would you put this huge surge of current? You'd build a big capacitor, maybe two, three hundred feet in diameter and a mile long. And you, and when this surge of current goes, you charge this daylight side of that capacitor. It doesn't last very long. You know, it discharges this uh, atmosphere, and then <clears throat> for the next few days, you're pumping out power to, you know, whoever. Where can you do this? Anywhere on the planet. Where does this power come from? The sun. The sun is throwing uh, solar wind by us, you know, all day long, all night long. Now we're going to go to some technologies that you haven't heard of. You can build one of these in your garage. There's nothing to it. You put it in a 45-gallon drum. So see the outside of that? 45 gallon carbon steel drum. What's inside of it? There are three cones. They're stuck inside of each other. So if you stick the cone down inside of there, you've got repulsion all the way around. So it's kind of this unstable thing, but it's, the, the plan is for it to just kind of like sit there. Okay? Then you stick a second cone on top. It's the same thing. It's, it's bottom is sticking in this apex, and then the top one is sticking in this apex. And then the last thing you do is, you screw down the top that's got a magnet in repulsion, and it's basically column loading this thing. So it's like shaky and unstable to begin with. What happened when he did this was, <coughs> it took off and blew up his garage. <laughs> <laughs>